So uh, just to, uh, by way of motivation, uh, so what is the question we're asking here? So as uh, Jim noted, you know, in our team more broadly, we've been doing research on inequality and mobility using various administrative data sources. And when the COVID shock hit, uh, we started to think about how we could contribute to this very important crisis. Uh, and like many others, you know, wanted to understand how COVID-19 is affecting uh, the American economy, what policies might mitigate its adverse impacts going forward. Now, in thinking about that sort of macroeconomic question, of course, there's a long tradition of uh, studying those questions, going back to the work of Simon Kuznets that Catherine talked about in her presentation, um, foundational work at, at MBER, where macro policy decisions have traditionally been based on data from recurrent surveys of households and businesses. So we uh, use things like the current population survey or the monthly retail trade survey to construct, uh, I think, vital aggregate information, statistics we all rely upon, like GDP, unemployment rates, and so forth. But I think those data, especially in the era of big, da of big data, have two limitations that have be become apparent uh, in the pandemic. So first, they're only available at relatively low frequencies, often with significant time lags. So for instance, if you're interested in data on consumer expenditures, typically researchers would turn to the consumer expenditure survey, which gives you information on a quarterly basis, typically you know, one year after the quarter that you're interested in. Uh, and so, of course, from a real-time policy sort of perspective, it's going to be difficult to use data like that um, to, to make decisions. Second, uh, the data that we have from surveys, largely because of limitations in sample size, can't be disaggregated to examine variation across fine areas or subgroups. So if you want to understand issues of inequality, for example, uh, which wage groups or which sectors are being hit hardest by the shock, what types of policies should be implemented going forward, that is very difficult to do with uh, existing data. And so recognizing those issues, what we uh, sought to do is to build a publicly available economic tracker, a publicly available data, database using transaction data from several private companies to measure daily economic activity, so at a very high frequency, in a very granular way by zip code, by income group, by industry. Now, I want to emphasize, unlike a lot of recent research using private sector data, which I think has been incredibly valuable, so point to since uh, Diana's on the call, the terrific work being done by her group at J.P. Morgan Chase and collaborators in academia, that work, I think, has been really valuable in the research results uh, that have come out of it. But the, the model to date, you know, there and a lot of the other work we do on our team relies on internal access to confidential data. And that's for good reason, you know, there are serious privacy constraints that can prevent the release of that data. And so as Bill was correctly pointing out, I worry with a lot of our graduate students, you know, how do you get folks in large numbers access to the data that are really, I think, the fuel of knowledge uh, in the field uh, at this point. And so what we sought to do here is something a, a little bit different. What I wanted to do is figure out a way to construct public statistics that are sufficiently granular for research and policy. So they're disaggregated enough that you can make progress on lots of questions that people are interested in answering, yet are sufficiently aggregated and massed such that companies like credit card companies, for instance, are actually willing to release the data publicly. So there's a really sharp tension between those two goals. And one of my objectives methodologically in doing this project was to try to figure out, can you navigate that trade-off? Let's just try to do it as a demonstration and see if we can make this work uh, to address you know, some of the issues Catherine was raising, for example, at the end of her presentation. Is this a feasible path for constructing national statistics going forward? And so in the spirit of doing that demonstration, uh, what I'm gonna focus on in the bulk of uh, this presentation is how we use these new data to analyze the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and analyze the impacts of various stabilization policies. But before turning to that, let me first spend a little bit of time telling you about the data that we construct, starting with the partners that we're working with to measure various key aspects of economic activity. So consumer spending, uh, what we're gonna do there is use information from various credit card aggregators
So in particular, we started with a company called Affinity Solutions, which sees about 10% of credit and debit card transactions in the United States and manages loyalty programs for various credit card companies. And so that gives you a window into what spending patterns look like in a very detailed way, as you'll see in a second. We're also incorporating data from MasterCard, which of course has another big window into uh, spending activity. Um, another company called CoinOut. So when you're looking at these different data sources, one thing that I've found is, you know, you have really good coverage from companies like MasterCard, but of a certain slice of transactions, right? So uh, as we started to do this work and present some results, colleagues would often ask us, aren't you missing cash transactions? And couldn't that be particularly important at the low end of the income distribution? Well, it turns out there's this company called CoinOut, which gives people rewards uh, for scanning their receipts. And so for about 1 million people, you can get data on cash transactions from that source. And so it's just an example of how, you know, you can triangulate various things, I think, to get a more complete picture of economic activity. So we use that sort of information on the spending side. We then get data on small business revenues, aggregating credit and debit card transaction from different companies uh, that essentially have a set of businesses that they're working with. Again, seeing something like a 10% slice of the US economy from a company called Wampley, complemented by a data from MasterCard that we'll be incorporating uh, shortly. We then look at data on employment from various payroll companies. So Paychex processes uh, something like 10% of uh, payroll um, or 7, 8% of payroll in the United States. Uh, Intuit is another big player in this market. So combining these various companies listed here, you have data on about uh, 13 million workers, um, employment patterns and hours of work and wages and so forth. And then uh, another important aspect of the labor market is not just who's currently employed, but what the prospects for employment are going forward. And so there it's really useful to be able to measure job postings and we get data from a online job posting aggregator called Burning Glass which covers essentially all job postings in the United States. And then finally, briefly I'll mention at the end, some data from a company called Zern, where we use to track long-term impacts on educational progress of kids, which as you'll see, I think adds a useful layer to this analysis. So before I go on, I just wanna mention, given the focus on data in this conversation today, you know, it's, it's a big effort as Diana was pointing out, to take these raw transactional sources of data and construct something that is useful for research and policy. So we have a team of about 25 folks working on uh, these uh, data sets. And you know, that involves uh, mundane things like dealing with breaks in the data because of changes in the clients these companies had and things like that, to smoothing seasonal fluctuations, to I think quite importantly, dealing with privacy issues. So as Jim was noting, particularly with the publicly traded companies, there are serious restrictions in terms of what types of data can be made publicly available. Uh, and so as you'll notice, as I'm going through this, in a lot of cases, we're gonna combine data from multiple companies. We're gonna mask things and index things in certain ways, which allow us to get everyone comfortable and basically move forward in a way that complies with SEC regulations. And that's the type of navigation that I think is gonna be crucial going forward to incorporate these types of data into public statistics. One final challenge in working with any data like this uh, is that they're obviously not nationally representative by design. So the big advantage of the government surveys is that they are at least designed to, be, to provide representative statistics about the US population, which is of course what we care about from a research and policy perspective. If you take any one of these companies, you're gonna learn about uh, how the clients of paychecks are doing, not necessarily what employment looks like in the US as a whole. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to benchmark these data sets against national aggregates in order to figure out which data sets to use, how to combine them and so forth. And so I just wanna give you a flavor of how that looks, uh, both to illustrate the pitfalls and the promise of these sorts of data sources. So here is an example plotting uh, data from the monthly retail trade survey in orange on uh, spending in the food services category. Um, and so, you know, you can see how this bounces around and then drip dips right when the COVID shock hits. And then we're overlaying data from the credit and debit card uh, company that I talked about, Affinity Solutions in green. And what you can see here is the Affinity data tracks the nationally representative data pretty well, 
it's not perfect. I don't certainly don't want to overstate things here. So there are certainly deviations, but on the scale of something like the shock induced by COVID, uh, it looks pretty good. So that's a case where we feel reasonably confident moving forward with, uh, with this sort of data. Give you another example on the payroll side, we combine data from paychecks into it and earn in uh, and construct series that are shown in the solid lines uh, for two industries, food services again, and professional services. And you can see once again, comparing to the current employment statistics, the national statistics collected by BLS, it's not perfect, uh, but it's pretty good in terms of tracking things uh, overall. So again, we think there's reasonable signal here. Now I wanna mention as a note of caution that there's by no means a guarantee, like these examples might suggest, oh, you know, you get private sector data and in general it sort of lines up with public statistics. That is definitely not the case. Let me give you an example that illustrates that. So this dash green series is data from a company called Homebase, which a lot of my colleagues in economics have been using in the past few months to study the COVID pandemic, to study labor markets. And the reason for that is Homebase has made their data very widely available, which has been a fantastic resource. But as you can see here, Homebase does not actually track uh, the national statistics very well at all in terms of magnitudes. Uh, and you know, that's despite the fact that it has about 1.6 million workers, you know, it just illustrates that there are no guarantees here. It's critical to do this sort of benchmarking to be able to use uh, these types of data. So what we do is essentially try to identify a, data, a set of data sources that track the national aggregates reasonably well. And we then use that to see how far we can get in try, trying to understand the impacts of COVID-19 uh, and then analyze the impacts of various policies. So let me now turn to showing you how we apply these data, uh, starting by looking at the impacts of uh, COVID on consumer spending. So if you look at national accounts data, you see that the fall in GDP was driven primarily by a reduction in consumer spending as opposed to changes in imports or exports or government purchases or private investment. And so I'm gonna start by looking at what happens to spending and did, using the, the private sector data, uh, the public statistics constructed from that uh, to um, disaggregate the picture and understand what's going on in, in a finer way. And so the first thing we're gonna do is look at trends in consumer spending by income quartile, breaking down the data by income group. And so what you're seeing here is uh, just a time series plot of consumer spending from the credit and debit card data uh, for 2019 shown in the dashed line and 2020 shown in the solid line. And what you can see is right when the COVID shock hits um, in, uh, in late March, in, in mid-March, you see that spending among high income consumers falls by about $3 billion, uh, nearly a 40% reduction. And then since that point, you have a gradual recovery such that if you look at data as of the, uh, a few weeks ago, you're down about three quarters of a billion dollars, about 10% relative to baseline. Now let's compare that to what happens to people in the bottom income quartile. So for these folks, you see that spending falls by about a billion dollars per day, uh, also a substantial drop, but considerably less than what you saw for folks uh, for higher income uh, households, both in percentage terms and particularly in dollar terms. And then moreover, if you look at what has happened over time, you see that there's a more rapid recovery in terms of spending for lower income households. And by the time you're in something like late May or June, you're essentially back to baseline levels. So the first key fact that you see, and this is mirrored in what you see in the internal JP Morgan Chase data, for instance, is that much of the spending reduction in absolute terms has been driven by a reduction in spending by high income rather than low income households. Second key point uh, is that most of that reduction in spending, if you look at where it's occurring, it's occurring in categories that you might think of as in-person services. So things like hotels and food or recreational activities, things that you have to go out of your house to consume, as opposed to things like durable goods, which as you all probably know, are traditionally the things that fall a lot more in recessions. Um, and so, you know, if you look uh, at, at what this looks like in terms of changes in spending, especially relative to the share of pre-COVID spending, you find that the reduction in spending is particularly concentrated in in-person services, 
relative to the initial shares. So these kinds of categories accounted for only a third of spending initially, but they account for two thirds of the decline. So why is this useful to note? I think it illustrates that the reduction in spending is driven primarily by health concerns among the rich rather, rather than a reduction in purchasing power or the fall in the stock market or things like that, because the nature of the reduction is very concentrated in things that might lead to an exposure to COVID infection, as opposed to what you might expect more broadly if people are feeling less wealthy. So what I wanna do next is show you how this reduction in spending by the rich, in particular on in-person services, then cascades through the economy to affect economic activity in various ways. So let's now look at what happens to businesses as they have this fall in consumer demand. And I'm gonna exploit the fact that consumer demand fell particularly among high income folks for things that they consume uh, in person, right? And where do you tend to consume things in person? It's around your house, locally around where you live. And so it turns out to be very useful to disaggregate these data geographically, now looking at changes in small business revenues by zip code. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples that illustrate the key result and then generalize. So let's look at the data by zip code here in New York City. And what we're plotting here are changes in small business revenue from uh, January to April. And what you can see is the map is colored such that the dark red colors represent areas where businesses located in those places lost more revenue and blue green colors represent areas where they lost less revenue. You can see that in the most affluent parts, parts of New York, the Upper East Side, for example, businesses are losing 65, 70% of their revenues. Whereas if you go up to the Bronx or you go to Queens, go to parts of New Jersey, Newark and so forth, you're seeing numbers more like 20%, 25%. And that makes a lot of sense in light of the result that I just talked about on the consumer spending side. High income folks are cutting back on the amount they're spending and that's affecting business revenues, particularly in affluent areas. You see the same sort of pattern in San Francisco. Look at the most affluent parts of San Francisco, like Pacific Heights, for example, massive reductions in small business revenue there. You look at Berkeley, for example, but if you look at the less affluent areas like Alameda or the East Bay, much, much smaller reductions in revenue. So, uh, you know, generalizing upon this, if you look across the United States at more affluent zip codes, places with higher monthly rents, for example, you see significantly larger losses in small business revenue in those areas, precisely because that's where consumer demand uh, fell the most. So the next piece, if you kind of think about dominoes falling in, in the economy, what I wanna to turn to next is how that then ends up affecting employment patterns in the US turning to the payroll data. And so I'm gonna start by showing you the aggregate picture, again, disaggregating by income level, and then turn to the spatial variation to understand what's going on. Um, and so uh, what you can see here first is we're plotting data on the total number of people employed by wage quartile. So just to be clear on the way we're constructing this, we're dividing uh, people into four wage groups based on initial wage quartiles. And we're asking essentially how many jobs are there in the top wage quartile versus the bottom wage quartile week by week. And what you can see here is I think two interesting things. First, there's a much sharper reduction in terms of employment for people at the bottom of the wage distribution than the top of the wage distribution. So if you look at the trough around April 15th, about a 30% reduction in employment for people in the bottom wage quartile compared with 10% at the, in the top wage quartile. And then, you know, we've heard a lot in the media about a possibility of a V-shaped recession. Well, you do in fact see a V-shaped recession, but only for people in the top wage quartile where you're basically back to baseline employment levels within about six weeks uh, of the trough um, and you stay around there. Whereas for people in the bottom wage quartile, um, you have uh, less of a recovery, still a substantial recovery, but a recovery that has uh, is only 50% of the way back to where you were in terms of job losses, and then seems to have essentially slowed since that point based on timesheet data that we can use to predict employment patterns in more recent weeks. So that's the aggregate picture. Let me now show you how that plays out spatially in connection to the sequence of shocks that I described. So if we now zoom in on employment of low wage workers, which is where the action really is, as I just showed you, on the previous plot, 
just look at the data again for the Bay Area, you see a map that looks almost exactly what I showed you on the business revenue side. Workers who happen to work in, say, a restaurant in the affluent parts of San Francisco are nearly 70% have lost their jobs. Whereas if you happen to work at a similar place, you know, over here in San Leandro, there's a 20% chance that you lost your job. So it matters tremendously where you're working because of the sequence of shocks uh, that I was describing. So one final point on this, again, you see this more broadly uh, across the United States, higher rent areas tend to have uh, bigger losses in employment. Furthermore, this is also true in terms of hiring going forward. So of course, what matters in terms of economic recovery is not just who's gotten laid off, but what the vacancies look like going forward. And so if you look at the job posting data, you see a very similar pattern where job postings are much lower in the high rent areas than the lower rent areas, which I think does not bode well in terms of prospects for recovery in those places, at least in the time being. It looks like there's gonna be sustained job loss for some time. So motivated by those set of diagnostic results. And Jim, if I could, could I just check on the time? I'm not able to see the time here. Do we have a few more minutes? Yeah, I would say take about another five minutes, it'd be great. Great, perfect. So in the, in the last five minutes, um, uh, let me now pivot from that sort of diagnostic analysis with these data and show you, you know, naturally the question is what can we do to try to mitigate those employment losses and try to uh, restore economic activity as best we can going forward. And so the way I'm gonna approach that is again, using these publicly available statistics that we've constructed to evaluate the impacts of three sets of policies that have been implemented at the state level and the federal level. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about are state ordered reopenings. So, uh, you know, there's lots of discussion of basically, can you have executive orders that either shut down or restart economic activity? And so what we're gonna do is use these data which we can look at you know, across every state and basically compare trends across states that opened versus closed at different times. And I'm just gonna show you one case study that summarizes the key result. Uh, here we're comparing New Mexico and Colorado that both closed around a similar time, but Colorado began reopening about two weeks before New Mexico did. And the key thing to take away here is if you look at spending patterns or if I were to show you employment or any number of other statistics, they basically trend identically in these two places. You know, if you pool dozens of different states, you start to see, you know, maybe a one percentage point impact or something like that, but there's hardly any impact of these policies in the grand scheme of things. And the reason for that, I think, is quite intuitive, which is, as I was saying earlier, the fundamental driver of the reduction in economic activity, I think, is a reduction in spending primarily by high-income households who have the capacity to self-isolate, work remotely, et cetera, and I don't think it's fundamentally restrictions on economic activity that are driving what's going on until you restore consumer confidence. I don't think uh, an executive order to reopen the state is really gonna do that much. Second major policy, stimulus payments. So as you know, as part of the CARES Act, uh, about 160 million households received typically $1,200 checks per individual exactly on April 15th, if you look at uh, direct deposit data. So what did the stimulus work in restoring consumer spending and then restoring economic activity? Here we can rely on the fact that we have daily data on spending and can again examine in a very fine way what happened right when those stimulus checks were sent out on April 15th. And what you can see is if you look at spending for people in the bottom income quartile shown in the blue here, there's almost immediately, if you compare April uh, you know, 20th versus April, 14th, a 20 percentage point jump in spending when the stimulus checks went out. Uh, a smaller jump for higher income households as is to be expected given they have a lower marginal propensity to consume and get less stimulus to, to begin with. So at a surface level, it looks like the stimulus really works in terms of getting people to spend more. But let's dig a bit more deeply into this. So what we can do now is look at the data literally day by day. The plots that I was showing you before were smoothed moving weekly averages. Now I'm literally gonna date, plot the data day by day. And what you can see is if you look at April 12th or 13th versus April 16th, there's a 25 percentage point jump in spending for households in the bottom quartile. So again, confirming that there's that huge immediate impact of the stimulus on consumer spending, but if you now ask where was that money spent, you see most of that money was spent on durable goods 
which remember was not the area where spending fell to begin with, and very little of it was spent on in-person services, which is where a huge part of the cut came to begin with when the COVID shock hit. So why does this matter? If you think about how macroeconomic stimulus would ideally work from a Keynesian perspective, uh, what we're hoping is that consumers spend the money at the businesses that lost the most revenues, that then, who then use that money to hire back workers, and then you have this kind of virtuous cycle that emerges in the economy. If instead consumers are taking that money and spending it on online retail like Amazon and Walmart, who A, either use you know, more capital than labor, or B, are relying more on imports, uh, the impacts of the stimulus in terms of the multiplier effect could be greatly diminished. And so our sense from these types of data is, you know, there's less of a capacity for the stimulus to really have an impact on employment because of these reasons. Last policy I wanna talk about, loans to small businesses. So the, another major aspect of the CARES uh, Act was $500 billion of loans to small businesses through the Paycheck Protection Program, forgivable loans if you maintain payroll at a high enough level. So did that work? So we can again use the payroll data to, to assess that in a very simple way, relying on the fact that small businesses for the purposes of the PPP were defined as firms with fewer than 500 employees. And so we're just gonna do a simple comparison of trends in employment for firms with fewer than 500 employees versus more than 500 employees. And what you can see here is that before the PPP program began, those two th uh, firms were having relatively similar trends in employment. After the PPP was implemented, firms with fewer than 500 employees have slightly more employment growth than firms with, few, with, that, with more than 500 employees that are ineligible for PPP, the control group, so to speak. But that effect is not all that large. And so, you know, if, if you estimate what the impact is, it's about a two percentage point increase in employment as a result of the PPP program, which is not trivial, but when you recognize that we spent $500 billion on the program, it translates to a cost for job saved of about $300,000. And the reason for this is the vast majority of the PPP payments are going to firms that would have maintained their payroll anyway, uh, and as a result, the marginal impact doesn't look like it's all that large, which I think would have been really useful to know to potentially retarget the program differently uh, if we could have seen this evidence you know, within three weeks of implementing the program. So let me show one final uh, chart and then conclude. So uh, we have some time for, for questions. So naturally, you know, I think in a crisis like this, where we're very focused on short run impacts, how can we restore employment and so forth? But I think it's also important to keep our eye on potential longer term impacts, and especially given our group's interest in long term issues of inequality and social mobility, we were interested in understanding what's happening to kids uh, in this crisis in terms of educational progress. And so this is data from uh, a platform called Zern, which about 1 million kids in the US use as part of their regular school curriculum to learn math. And this is showing you the number of math lessons that kids completed for kids in high income households versus low income households. And you can see that when schools went remote in mid-March, for high income households, there was a little bit of a drop and then a pretty rapid recovery in terms of progress in math. For low income households though, there was a 60% reduction in terms of um, learning that has persisted. And that of course, I think is very worrying in terms of uh, what implications this has for the long run. So to conclude, you know, I've already mentioned this, so I'll be very brief. You know, I think there's limited capacity to re restore consumer spending via traditional economic tools in the midst of a pandemic. I think the fundamental issue here is addressing the pu public health uh, concerns. In the meantime, I think focusing on things like shoring up the social safety net, thinking about how you mitigate hardship for the workers who've uh, lost their jobs, I think is where uh, we ought to be concentrating. And then just coming back to the theme of this conversation and some of the issues that Catherine raised in her presentation, I just wanna end by talking about where we're hoping to go with this. You know, Diana talked about the need for a centralized warehouse to kind of collect all of this information. I absolutely agree with that sentiment. I don't think it should be one research group like ours that's happening to, to put this together and when a crisis hits. Uh, what I wanted to do is see if you could do this on a small scale as a prototype. And now we've connected with the leaders of the LSBA and census, the major statistical agencies of the US, and we're starting a project
to construct a more permanent system of granular real-time national accounts, building on what we've done here. I also wanna emphasize that everything that I showed you in the previous few slides is constructed purely off of public data. So to Bill's question, uh, none of this is using internal confidential data. It's all data that can be freely downloaded from a website that we've set up, tracktherecovery.org, that also has an interactive data visualization platform that you all can, can use yourselves. And then going forward, we're also talking with many policymakers about how this, these data can be used at a state and federal level to try to fine tune uh, policies going forward. So let me stop there.